Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. While many fringe theories remain unproven, some have shockingly turned out to be based in fact after previously being dismissed as the ramblings of the tinfoil hat crowd. In November of 2023, Paranormality Magazine listed five conspiracy theories that turned out to be true. Tonight, we dig a bit deeper into that article, expanding more on each of the five conspiracies – Project MK Ultra, the Gulf of Tonkin, Operation Northwoods, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, and the one that affects every single one of us – surveillance outreach by our own government. All conspiracy theories that, after being investigated, were found to be true. The implications are chilling. MK Ultra. On April 10, 1953, Alan Dulles, the new director of the CIA, gave a speech to Princeton alumni. Although it was a regular event, the world was tense. The Korean War was almost over and the New York Times had reported that American soldiers returning from the war might have been brainwashed by communists. Some soldiers confessed to crimes the U.S. denied, like using germ warfare. Others were so brainwashed they didn't want to come back to America. At the same time, the U.S. was secretly planning to overthrow a leader in Iran. Dulles was the first civilian to lead the CIA, and his speech showed his focus on the battle for men's minds. He warned about the Soviet Union's brainwashing tactics, calling them brain warfare. He described Soviet methods as effective but terrible, and he was worried about what they were using, maybe chemicals or hypnosis. Three days after his speech, Dulles approved MKUltra, a secret CIA program to study mind control using things like drugs, hypnosis, and shock therapy. They used various people for their experiments, including soldiers, prisoners, and even mentally impaired children. Some volunteered, some were forced, and some didn't even know they were part of the experiments. One infamous experiment involved Whitey Bulger, a crime boss who was an inmate during MK Ultra tests. He described horrifying experiences, like seeing blood on walls and people turning into skeletons. He said he was given LSD, a drug the CIA thought might help in interrogations. The CIA was very secretive about MKUltra. They even set up a fake bedroom in San Francisco where they observed people unknowingly given LSD. The CIA used this to study the effects of the drug and also to see how prostitutes could be used to gather information. MKUltra ended in 1963 after a CIA inspector general found out about experiments on unwilling subjects. In 1977, Senator Edward Kennedy led hearings to investigate MKUltra. They discovered disturbing details like the suicide of Dr. Frank Olson, who jumped out of a window after being given LSD without his knowledge. The hearings faced many obstacles because CIA members claimed they couldn't remember details or how many people were involved. Worse, in 1973, MKUltra's director had all the files destroyed, making it hard to learn the full story. Despite the investigations, many secrets about MKUltra will likely remain hidden forever. The Gulf of Tonkin Incident In August 1964, 
the American destroyer USS Maddox was stationed in the Gulf of Tonkin, near North Vietnam. The ship was involved in two events known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident, which had a huge impact on history. On August 2, the Maddox was attacked by North Vietnamese torpedo boats. Two days later, on August 4, the Johnson administration claimed it had been attacked again. After the second attack, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, allowing the government to use military force in Vietnam. This was almost like declaring war, but it was based on a lie. Decades later, in the early 2000s, nearly 200 documents were declassified by the National Security Agency, the NSA. These documents revealed that there was no attack on August 4th. U.S. officials had lied about the Gulf of Tonkin incident for their own benefit, possibly to help President Johnson politically. This lie led to a war that killed 58,220 Americans and over 3 million Vietnamese. After President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, President Lyndon B. Johnson and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara increased military pressure on North Vietnam. They helped South Vietnam with attacks and gathering intelligence. This plan, called Operations Plan or OPLAN 34A, was run by the U.S. Department of Defense and the CIA, but carried out by South Vietnamese forces. By 1964, OPLAN 34A focused on sea attacks. The North Vietnamese started tracking the Maddox, which was gathering intelligence and supporting South Vietnamese attacks. On August 2, three North Vietnamese boats attacked the Maddox. The Maddox fired back and called for help, damaging the enemy boats. On August 4, the Maddox and another destroyer, the USS Turner Joy, reported seeing enemy vessels again. They thought they were under attack and sent urgent messages, however, it turned out to be a false alarm, caused by bad weather and poor equipment. Despite doubts, the U.S. government used these reports to justify more military action. On August 5, President Johnson went on television to announce the supposed attacks and ordered retaliation. Congress quickly passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, giving Johnson the power to escalate the Vietnam War. Years later, it was revealed that many reports about the attacks were false. President Johnson and Secretary McNamara ignored evidence showing no second attack happened. They used the distorted reports to push for war. The Gulf of Tonkin incident led to the U.S. becoming deeply involved in the Vietnam War, causing massive loss of life and changing history forever. Operation Northwoods. In 1962, the Joint Chiefs of Staff came up with a plan called Operation Northwoods. This plan called for CIA agents to attack U.S. military personnel and civilians and then blame it on Cuba's communist government. The goal was to create a reason for the United States to go to war with Cuba. In the early 1960s, America was worried about Fidel Castro, the communist leader of Cuba. Castro had taken over Cuba in 1959, making it the first communist state in the Western Hemisphere. The United States saw this as a big threat because Cuba is only 90 miles from Florida. After the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, the U.S. wanted a new way to deal with Castro. General Edward Lansdale asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff to come up with reasons to justify U.S. military intervention in Cuba. They responded with Operation Northwoods, a plan to fake attacks by Cuba on the U.S. Operation Northwoods suggested various fake attacks, including staging attacks at Guantanamo Bay, sinking ships full of Cuban refugees, and pretending a civilian aircraft was shot down. One idea was to blow up a U.S. ship and then blame Cuba, which would make Americans angry and support going to war. Another idea was to stage a communist Cuban terror campaign in the U.S., including bombings and fake attacks on Cuban refugees. Perhaps the most extreme idea was to fake the shooting down of a civilian airliner by Cuban forces. This would involve creating a fake airline with fake passengers to make it look real. However, President John F. Kennedy rejected Operation Northwoods. He told General Lansdale that he had no plans to use military force against Cuba. 
the plan was never put into action. For many years, Operation Northwoods remained a secret. It was revealed in 2001 by author James Bamford in his book Body of Secrets. The plan was so shocking and embarrassing that the Joint Chiefs of Staff kept it hidden. Operation Northwoods shows how far some U.S. military leaders were willing to go during the Cold War. If the plan had been carried out, it could have led to a war with Cuba and the imposition of military rule over the Cuban people, exactly what the U.S. accused Castro of doing. Many people who were close to President Kennedy denied knowing about Operation Northwoods. Theodore Sorensen, Kennedy's special counsel, said that he had never heard of it and called it illegal and unwise. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, also denied knowing about it. Operation Northwoods is a disturbing part of U.S. history, reflecting the extreme measures considered during the Cold War, as well as the potential dangers of government secrecy, deception, and outright lies. The Tuskegee Syphilis Study The Tuskegee experiment began in 1932, a time where there was no cure for syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease. The study involved 600 African-American men in Macon County, Alabama, who were promised free medical care. The goal was to observe the progression of the disease. The participants, mostly sharecroppers who had never seen a doctor before, were told that they were being treated for bad blood, a term used for various ailments. Out of the 600 men, 399 had syphilis and 201 did not. They were monitored by doctors from the U.S. Public Health Service PHS, which ran the study. Instead of receiving proper treatment, though, they were given placebos like aspirin, even after penicillin became the standard cure for syphilis in 1947. The PHS persuaded local doctors not to treat the men and instead conducted the study at the Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, founded by Booker T. Washington. The researchers wanted to see the full course of the disease, so they provided no real care, leading to severe health problems, blindness, insanity, and death among the participants. In the mid-1960s, Peter Buxton, a PHS investigator, learned about the study and reported it as unethical. However, the PHS decided to continue the study until all participants had died, autopsies were done, and data collected. Frustrated, Buxton leaked the story to the press. Gene Heller of the Associated Press broke the news in July 1972, causing public outrage and forcing the study to end. By then, 28 men had died from syphilis, 100 more from complications, 40 spouses were infected, and the disease had been passed to 19 children at birth. In 1973, Congress held hearings, and in 1974 the survivors and the families of the deceased received a $10 million settlement. New guidelines were established to protect people in government-funded research. The Tuskegee experiment led to deep mistrust of public health officials and vaccines among African Americans. To promote healing, President Bill Clinton apologized in 1997, calling the experiment deeply, profoundly, morally wrong. He also announced the creation of Tuskegee University's National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare. The last study participant died in 2004. Tuskegee wasn't the first unethical syphilis study. In 2010, President Barack Obama and other officials apologized for a similar experiment in Guatemala from 1946 to 1948. In that study, nearly 700 people, including prisoners and mental patients, were intentionally infected with syphilis without their consent to see if penicillin could prevent the disease. Many never received treatment, and the study results were never published. Dr. John Cutler, who led the Guatemala study, later worked on the Tuskegee experiment. Historian Susan Reverby discovered the records of the Guatemala study in 2010, leading to apologies from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, and President Obama. Surveillance Overreach The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or FISC, 
found that the FBI might have violated the rights of millions of Americans by improperly searching data collected by the National Security Agency's NSA, Mass Surveillance Program. U.S. District Court Judge James E. Boesberg highlighted these issues in a 2018 ruling that was later made public. Critics of the government's surveillance program believe this confirms that FBI agents were looking through Americans' communications without warrants, violating the Fourth Amendment's protections against unreasonable searches and seizures. Patrick Toomey from the American Civil Liberties Union said the FBI's searches often looked like phishing expeditions through people's personal emails and messages. The ruling revealed that the FBI misused data obtained through the NSA's program, which was exposed by whistleblower Edward Snowden. The NSA's program intercepts Internet communications and gathers data directly from major tech companies without needing warrants. This authority expanded in 2008 and renewed in 2018 allows the government to collect large amounts of data, some of which belongs to Americans. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, allows the government to monitor communications without targeting Americans directly. However, this often results in collecting data from U.S. citizens. The FBI then searches this data, a practice known as backdoor searches. In 2017, the FBI conducted about 3.1 million searches on Americans, compared to 7,500 combined searches by the CIA and NSA. Many FBI searches were illegal because they were not related to any criminal investigation. For example, in March 2017, the FBI searched surveillance data for communications related to an FBI facility, suggesting agents were spying on each other. On December 1, 2017, they ran 6,800 queries using social security numbers. The contract linguists even searched data on themselves and their family. The FBI blamed these issues on misunderstandings by its staff about what qualifies as a legitimate search. After Boesberg's ruling, the FBI agreed to change how agents can search FISA data. The FBI's abuse of surveillance data is partly due to a type of investigation called an assessment, which allows agents to investigate anyone based on minimal suspicion. These assessments enable the FBI to search mass surveillance data without a warrant, using national security as a justification. The FBI claims that documenting the reasons for their searches would hinder their work. This practice, called parallel construction, allows the FBI to use evidence obtained from mass surveillance in court by pretending it was obtained legally through traditional means. In one case, the FBI used data from the NSA's surveillance program to investigate Vasilydin Krubinov, who was later convicted of terrorism-related charges. The FBI claimed they got the evidence through legal FISA methods, but it was actually from the NSA's mass surveillance program. Overall, the FISA court ruling exposed how the FBI has been misusing surveillance data, leading to changes in how they conduct searches and highlighting the ongoing debate over privacy and security. So there you have it, five of the wildest conspiracy theories that have been proven true. Stay vigilant and keep questioning the official narrative. The truth is out there. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.